Okay, um, let's get started. I wanted to talk to you about two things today. One is to continue with the discussion on locking that I uh, started last time. And I'm going to talk, actually, locking is just a technique to, in, to talk about what's called concurrency. And I'll focus on concurrency, and, but mostly talk about locking. Uh, and then I'll talk about design principles. We had this in, uh, notion of properties, desirable properties. And so to achieve these properties of scaling and support for heterogeneity and things like that, we have some well-known design principles. So I'll actually go through those. And that's probably going to, be, going to take me to the end of the, uh, end of the class today. And in the next two lectures, next week, we'll talk about uh, some design techniques, like a toolkit. Okay? These are principles which are like big picture things. And the toolkits are specific techniques we can use to, to implement these uh, design principles and then some algorithms, depending on how much time we have. So let me uh, start with uh, concurrency and locking. And to introduce this, I'm going to uh, uh, set up a toy example. And it's a very common toy example, a very common thing that happens in many places. You probably have seen it if you actually implemented anything uh, in, in, a realistic, in a realistic system. So let me just show you what it is. Um, we have the following uh, issue. We have some kind of. A Q, and this is a queue of packets or tasks or jobs, and explain a bit of what it is. And what we have is we have a bunch of uh, uh, concurrent processes which are servicing the queue. So where would this arise? Uh, imagine that you have a web server. Okay? In the web server, what happens is that we have a, a, a request coming in to the web server. And if the server is busy, what happens is it gets put in a queue. Okay? At some point, one of the threads that's serving the, the, the web, uh, web content, it, it'll say, is there something in the queue? Is there work for me to do? If it is, I'm going to pick up a job and take care of it. Okay? And that's basically happening over here. Same kind of thing is happening in your tic-tac-toe server, right? You have a request for somebody who wants to uh, access the tic-tac-toe server. You have a bunch of concurrent, uh, potentially concurrent processes, each handling one request. Now, you don't have to design it this way, but one way you can design it is that you have a, a set of uh, threads that is waiting. And when it sees that there is a, a some, somebody connected who wants to play, uh, then it takes that, actually it takes two requests for two players, and pops two players off, and then handles those by itself. Right? So basically, you have to have this notion of there being a, a queue of requests and some concurrent process, like a thread, okay, which is going to uh, serve these requests from the queue. So in, in, in talking about this, I've used a number of terms. Okay, I've used the word queue, a request, and concurrent, and a process. Okay, now I want to make sure everybody understands what these terms mean. So does anybody not understand these four terms? Queue, concurrent, process, and servicing a request? Is everybody comfortable with these terms? Yes? Concurrent. Concurrent means that we can't say which goes before and which goes after. They're happening in at the same time, right? So we can't say this happens before that, right? But uh, so concurrent means that there is no time ordering. Another way of using the word is parallel. Okay, but parallel has other connotations. Concurrent really means that they could both be at the queue at the same time. Okay, we don't know. <coughs> Anybody else? So you've all seen this, these terms before. Okay, good. All right, so. The issue over here is that we have somebody called a producer. In this case, the producer, you know, tic-tac-toe is just the request coming in. But it actually, this could be the interface between two layers. This could be TCP giving a packet to IP, and the IP is in the multi-threaded. And each IP thread decides to remove packets from the queue on its own and take care of them. So these are called a producer, and these are called consumers. And so the producer is putting requests into the queue, and the consumer is dealing with it. And you can see this happens all the time. 
right? You can, if you go into a bank and you go to a teller, then the producer is the customers coming in to the bank who are all standing in queue, and then you have a bunch of tellers, and the tellers, uh, each teller looks at the queue and picks up somebody from there, right? Uh, and, and so the, the uh, issue we want to deal with is the fact that there's a bit of a problem with this queue if you look at it more carefully. And let me explain what's happening exactly. Let's look into what this process is going to do. The process is going to go to the queue and it's going to ask the question, is there work for me? And is there work for me means, is the queue non-zero? If the queue is non-zero, there's work for me, right? So the, the, this, it goes something like this. If Q, okay, length is greater than zero, then do work else wait for Q. Okay? And so what does do work do? Then what do work really means is we're going to remove the job from Q. And then we're going to decrement the Q length. Okay? So that's pretty straightforward. So you know, if you write the code for this, you'd say, okay, Q length greater than zero. Then I'm going to remove the job from you, decrement the queue length, and then I'm going to do, you know, whatever process the job, something like that. Okay? Seems pretty straightforward. You know, nothing could go wrong with this, could it? Okay. And the answer is it could go wrong. And this is what will happen. Let's say there's exactly one job in the queue over here. It's only one job in the queue. And let's call this thread over here A, and let's call this thread over here B, the two job threads. So it could be the case that both A and B execute this statement at the same time. They both execute at the same time because guess what? We said this concurrent. We have no ordering, right? So A and B both come to the statement at the same time. They both evaluate the Q length. They both say, yeah, Q length is greater than zero. No problem. The first one, one of them, let's say A comes in. A removes the job from the Q, decrements the Q length, makes it zero, and then processes the job, right? While A is doing this, removing the job from the queue, B gets in, because it's, it, it's in this part of the, right, over here. B gets in, it says remove the job from the queue, but there's no job. So you get a segmentation fault, and the whole thing you know, dies, basically. Right. So what's going on is that we have concurrent access to this particular variable, Q length. This Q length variable is being written to. You read from it. Is it you're, this is a read access, right? This is a read. And over here, this is a, a write. And what's happening is that we want to make sure that when you read from this and you write from this, these two things happen together. Remember what I talked about atomicity? We want to have a transaction like a transfer of money. The same kind of thing is happening over here. We want to make sure that when you read from it and you write from that, nobody can sneak in between and, and kind of read again. OK? So to repeat what I said, we have this situation of a producer and consumers with the queue in between happening all, of, all the time. A naive implementation of this is to just this little piece of code. If Q is greater than zero, then do some work and then wait for Q. And what I showed you just took a minute to show you that all you have to worry, you know, that, that can have a problem. And this problem is very hard to debug because you write it and most of the time it's going to work. Every once in a while, every once in a few months, it dies. Oh, the program died. Why did it die? I don't know, it just died, okay? It was the phase of the moon, you know, or I don't know, the stars are not properly aligned. No, it was because this was violated, this particular constraint was violated. So what we have to do is to recognize that this Q length variable has to be protected, okay? We want to, we want to have what we call mutual exclusion. And what mutual exclusion means is that if process A is altering the 
uh, variable, process B cannot touch it. It's kept in a locked box, and nobody else can touch it. We're mutually excluding each other from access to that. Okay. Does, does that, any questions on this? OK, so that, in a sense, is what locking is all about. So I'm going to now talk about how we, we do locking, but that's the reason for, reason for locking. So let's, let's see how we could change this program to, to, uh, to remove this problem over here. So let me see. Do I, let me just rewrite it, and then it'll become clearer, sort of changing it in place. So I'm going to introduce something called a lock manager. I'll just write down the new term here. And a lock manager you can think of as a process which you go to and you ask the question, can I use this variable or not? Okay, if I can use the variable, you know, register me as a person who has a lock on this variable. If anybody else asks, tell them it's not available anymore. Okay, as simple as that. And when I'm done, I'm going to release it. Okay? So that's the lock manager. So here's the process again. So before we, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to read and we're going to write. So before we read and write the variable, we're going to get a lock on it. Okay? So we say something like this, get lock, and you get it on the Q length variable. And then you put my ID, whatever your ID is, that's my ID, so I got a lock on it. Then I'm going to do the same thing as before. If Q, you know what, I'm just going to call it QL. I'm fed up with writing Q like that. If QL is greater than zero, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, basically remove, remove the job. Okay, QL minus minus, I'm subtracting something from it. And then I'm going to uh, process the job. Okay, and actually, when I'm done with this, I can actually release the lock right there. I don't need to hold on to the lock. So I can just say release lock. Okay. And then process job. Okay, I'm going to actually write down in sort of a box over here this thing called release lock. Okay. All right, so let's first ignore this for a moment and look at this over here. What's happening over here is I get a lock on the Q-length variable, okay? So let's see what happens again now with the same two processes, A and B, exact same situation. There's only one packet in the queue. A comes in and, you know, what happens with this code rather than the previous code. In this code, A is going to get a lock on the Q-length variable, all right? And it's going to check if it's greater than zero. If it got the if it's greater than zero, it's going to remove the job, decrement it, and release the lock, okay? And then process the job. Now, let's say that process B, or thread B, whatever starts and enters at the same time. When it comes to this over here, it's got to be the case that either A or B got to the statement get lock first, okay? Doesn't matter who got there first, but if B gets to get lock, it's going to actually be uh, put into a, a wait state. It's just going to get a hang there saying, sorry, you didn't get a lock, okay? So you want, I mean, there are different ways of implementing this. I'll talk about it in just a moment. But for now, you can think of uh, the get lock as being like a blocking call, just like a read system call. Okay, and the read, when you read on a socket and there's no work to do, there's no packets available, you just block, you're just sitting there, right? Waiting for something to happen. Same thing can happen on get lock. So process gets to get lock, and when it gets to get lock, it'll just hang there, it'll be blocked, when the release lock happens, it will be released and it will say, oh yeah, QL is not greater than zero. Okay, because that job got taken by A, so B is going to just pop right out of here and continue on. Okay, so you can see that by putting this get lock, which is implemented by the lock manager. So the lock manager has basically just got a table and it kind of keep, takes care of things, makes sure that uh, you know, we don't override this variable. Okay. Any questions on this? Okay, so a couple of points I want to make and then we can take a break. The first one is that we actually had a design choice. We could have put the release lock right here or we could put the release lock over here, okay? What is the right thing to do? Yeah? Put it before, before you do the job? Before you do the job, why? Because uh, the job might take a 
while. Job may take a while. And what will happen while you have the lock? No one else will be able to take your job. That's right. So the lock over here, when you're holding on to it, actually 100 jobs might come in, right? If you were to release the lock over here as I showed over here, what's going to happen is nobody else can process those jobs. Okay? So in having a lock, it's a very powerful thing. Because once you have it, nobody else can get access to it. So you've got to be very careful to release it as soon as you possibly can. Okay? And so we call this the granularity of the lock. Okay? The granularity of the lock means that uh, how fine is it? For example, we could have 100 queues like this for the sake of argument between 100 different producers, 100 different types of consumers. And I could say, I'm going to lock all of them. You can lock all of them. Have, have the, okay? And if you do that, no queue would make progress because somebody got a lock. Right? That's not a particularly nice thing to do. Right? And that would be a very large grain lock. Okay? But you can make it very, very fine. Here I'm locking a very single, only one single variable. Okay? And that's what the least I can do. So granularity is both in sort of uh, space and time. Space meaning how many things am I locking? And you want to lock as few things as possible. And in time, how long am I holding on? So for, for space granularity, if you have very fine-grained locks, if you're locking individual variables like this, you have many, many locks. The lock manager has a lot of work to do. All right? But you have, if you do uh, large chunks of locking, you have a problem that you may have locking too much. Right? You're locking way, way too many things. In the time granularity, it's always good to release things quickly as soon as you're done with it, which means more overhead in terms of the lock manager coming in and doing its job and going away. And so we have to balance these in any kind of thing. So, but granularity is kind of an important thing. The second thing I want to talk about here is this notion of, um, <clears throat> okay, are there any questions on granularity, log granularity? Okay, the second thing I want to talk about here is that we actually uh, can think of the, uh, you know, let's say that there is a, a process over here which is basically uh, just reporting the queue length, okay? Report the queue length. And what this report queue length is doing is that it's just reading the queue length variable. It's not changing it. Okay? So here, we're actually changing the queue length over here. That's a right axis, as I showed you. Okay? And this is a read axis. Okay? This is a read axis. But if I have a report, it's going to just read. All it's going to do is basically print f the queue length. It's not changing the queue length. Why should this, why should we care about this particular uh, report queue length not changing the queue. Okay? If you locked it over here, what's happening is that even this innocuous process is unable to access the queue length variable because we can't test the queue length variable until we have the lock. Yeah? If you have read in a job but you haven't decremented the counter, it's going to give it a wrong answer. It will. It will give you a wrong answer. But let's say you're fine with that. Let's say you don't really care because you know, what I mean is that it's not clear semantically, if you read the job and you haven't processed it, you know, maybe you could do the queue length after the process of the job or something like that. But what I'm saying is that there is a situation where we can say that you have somebody reading as opposed to somebody writing. And writing is a bigger deal than reading. Okay? And so uh, in many cases, we can distinguish between readers and writers. Okay? So we have what you call read locks and write lock. And what we say is that in this kind of situation, it's OK to have multiple people reading at the same time. Maybe that answers your question, Andrew, better, right? Yeah. If I have multiple of these Q-length readers, there's no reason why they can't all read at the same time. Ignore the fact that it's being written for now. Certainly, they can all read, right? However, we certainly don't want two writers at the same time. Okay? So, and we could argue that we shouldn't have even one writer if you're multiple readers. Right? So we can say that either we can have all readers or one writer. And in some cases, we may tolerate one writer and many readers, but not many writers. Right? So you see what I mean? So we have this situation where you have uh, only, so we have readers. Okay? And so many readers are allowed. 
Okay, one writer plus many readers. And these are, these are, so if you have, if you allow only many readers, it's basically, you can think of it as a read exclusive. You can only read, okay? And the minute one writer comes in, all the reader, a writer can come in only when all the readers have left. There should be zero readers present. Whereas you can have another kind of lock, where you say you can have many readers and one writer. But of course, multiple writers is always bad. If we do this, then we can, if you allow this semantics, one writer plus many readers, then we can have as many report queue length processes as we want in parallel, which are just reading, and you can have one of these guys who's writing. Remember, writing just means that you're changing the variable over here. Okay, and this is what's called a readers writers lock. Okay, who readers, many readers, and up to, at most one writer. Okay, and whereas this one is sort of a read exclusive. Okay, and so it gets more complicated, and I don't, I don't want, really want to go more into that, but I just want to give you a flavor of what reading means and what writing means. And so by doing this, we can make this lock even more fine grained because now we're talking about reading versus writing. Okay, okay so a couple more things about, uh, about locks. Uh, so I, I wanted to tell you a bit about what happens when you say call get lock. Okay, what happens with get lock? They actually, yeah. Oh yeah, I need yeah. Sorry, I need an else release lock. Yeah. Yeah. So I should actually I should put that. Yeah. Sorry. I was yeah. So we need to put an else release lock, and actually that will fix the code. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yes, you have to be careful. And actually, I'm going to talk about <laughs> releasing locks in just a minute when I talk about uh, something called uh, when I talk about problems with locks. But let's we'll get there in a moment. Uh, let's talk instead right now for the moment about what happens over here when you get to get lock. So your process, it comes to get lock. What do you do? There are two approaches to it. One of them is called a, a spin, spinning lock. And what happens in a spin lock is that the process that is getting the lock is going to keep checking. Every, every, every instruction keeps checking and checking and checking. And, okay, and it basically wastes the CPU doing that. However, uh, it, it's very fast. In case the lock is released, you get it right away. Okay. The other thing is to put the process that is uh, checking, uh, that, that is blocked on a lock into a queue, okay? and you just hold it in the queue of, of blocked processes. And when you get release job, release lock, then you basically put, so you have a queue exactly like this of release of, of blocked processes. Okay? And whenever somebody releases it, you just say, okay, I'm going to pop off the first process and ask it to continue over here. So in fact, inside the lock manager, you have a producer consumer queue itself. Okay, so the lock manager uses locking okay, to implement how it works. Okay, so you just go release somebody. But it's not concurrent, okay, so you don't have to worry about that uh, over here. Okay, so uh, again, it gets into a bit kind of detail about are we, are we going to spin or are we going to uh, put it in a queue, and so it's just, uh, you don't really need to know the details, I just want to give you a sense of what happens over here. Okay, now uh, I want to move on to this notion of what could go wrong, okay, and some issues with logging. So uh, everything looks fine here. I mean, everything works, no problem. You got the granularity right. Just go ahead and implement it. What could possibly go wrong? Well, here's one situation. Let's say you get lock, okay, and well, you have a bug in the code, of course, and you forget to release it, like what I did. That shouldn't happen. You'll find that right away. What will happen is your code won't work. You get it. <laughs> but it could be worse. I could get a lock, and this process could die. Okay, you 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 do something stupid over here. If you release the lock, at this point, everybody's blocked. Okay, it's because you know you you could have any reason why it, it could be some corner case, whatever. You didn't handle it properly. You, you put, if you're Java, you, put, you didn't put a try and catch, but at any rate, your process is dead, holding a lock. What do you do? Yeah? Maybe if your process has like a time to live, it'll, like after a set amount of time and nothing happens, it'll just automatically release. Uh, who's going to release the lock? I mean, after all, the process is dead. No, because you died right here. 
When you're removing the job, you made a mistake and the process died right there. And it's holding the log and it dies. Yeah, but potentially, okay. So when somebody dies holding a lock, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'll give you a very kind of dramatic example of this. Uh, many of us have online accounts, right? For which only we know the passwords, right? So you're walking home from work, or I'm walking, I'm bicycling back from work as I usually do, and somebody, a truck runs over me, okay? I'm dying without knowing my, nobody else knows my lock. What happens to all the online stuff, okay? Uh, same problem. Luckily, it's not so gory in computer systems. <laughs> what happens is that um, one possibility is that the lock manager keeps a timer, right, as, as, as you mentioned. And uh, if a process is holding on to a lock for too long, whatever too long is, it says, I think this process is dead. It inquires and says, hey, is this process dead? Yes, it is. Okay, we'll break the lock and let people go through. Okay, that's one, po one possibility. The second possibility is that the uh, lock manager is, uh, is part of the process dying. So when the process dies, actually there's a lot of cleanup happening. All the memory resources it's holding on to, whatever other resources it's holding on to, have to be cleaned up anyhow. And so the locks are released as a matter of course, as part of that. So we, we do that, we can do that as well. In a distributed system, it's very complicated because I could, there could be a process that's somewhere in another part of the world holding a lock and a resource here, right? And it's holding on for you know, 10, 20 seconds. Well, it could just be because the network is down. Maybe it's holding on for a day, but just because the network, the, the connection went down. So should I break it? I don't know. Maybe I should wait for the network to come back, right? So in a distributed system, this gets really quite messy. And the short answer is we really don't know what to do. We have some, some reasonable things. You know, there are many, many research papers written about it, but uh, hopefully everything works fine. We don't have a problem. But if things break, okay, this is one place where, where distributed systems really have a difficult time because we cannot distinguish between failure and a long delay. We just can't distinguish between the two. Okay? And this is true in real life as well. right? You're waiting at a restaurant and you're supposed to meet a friend. Have you been stood up or they're just delayed in traffic? You don't know, right? And this is true for distributed systems in general. Okay? And uh, so, so we have to worry about that. That's one particular problem with locking, okay? and uh, no solution to it. A diff different kind of problem, a different kind of problem is called deadlock. And to explain that, let me draw this a little bit uh, differently over here. So here I have one producer and many consumers Let's assume that these consumers, after they finish the job, put their work into uh, a sort of another queue. So they do the job and they put the work into another queue. And then some other set of consumers are going to look at this queue over here. Okay, certainly, this seems reasonable thing to do. So you could have a TCP packet comes over here. You have multiple IP threads do their work and put it into here. Then the link layer comes and does its job. Okay, and certainly there's no reason why we can't. Uh, have the IP be multi-threaded, have the link layer processes be multi-threaded, and we can think of very many other things which have the same kind of processing. Okay, you have a multi-layer system, you do some processing here, these guys do some processing, put it in a queue, some other guys do some processing. Okay, you can think of many different kinds of systems where we have this situation, right? You've probably seen this somewhere or the other. Okay, so <clears throat> now we have the following problem. We have a, a Q length variable here and a Q length variable here. All right, and so, so we need to, uh, uh, this, let's look at thread A over here. Thread A is going to read the Q length variable and it's going to decrement it. And then it's going to go over here, it's going to uh, increment the Q length variable over here when it's done. All right, so you can see that you're writing to the queue length over here, you have a write access over here, and you have a write access over here as well for the, for the, for the uh, uh, concurrent thread A. Concurrent thread B is doing the same thing. It's writing over here and writing over there, okay? So uh, we have a lock here and you have a lock here, okay? Uh, let's, for a moment, imagine that A has this lock, okay? and is holding on to it until it finishes. So it's not releasing it over here, it's releasing it at the end, okay? If it's doing that, and B is doing the same thing, 
Then we have the following problem. A may hold this lock and B may hold that lock. And so, okay, because you want to acquire the lock, so we have, what, what A and B are going to do, the strategy is acquire two locks, do your work, release two locks. Okay? That could be one way of doing things, right? If you do this, what will happen is A holds this lock, B holds that lock, and neither one of them can get any work done. Okay, it's what's called a deadlock, right? So, uh, do, you see, do you see what's going on? Yeah. So the code will look something like this. I'm going to just show you the skeleton code just to make sure you understand what's going on. So I'm going to call this Q length. This is, I'm going to, let me call this QL1. Let me call this QL2. So I'm going to call this get lock. So the code looks like get lock QL1 ID get lock QL2 ID, and then some code over here, and then they have release lock, QL1 ID, and release lock, QL2 ID, okay. Actually, maybe this code will work, <laughs> uh, because they're going to both traffic QL1, and then they're both going to traffic QL2. Uh, Beg your pardon? I think that will be okay. That will be okay. I think we need to look at when you're acquiring locks. Uh, all right, so I, I have to, right, because this actually is, okay. So I'm going to actually have shown you the solution before the problem, which is, which is a problem. Okay, let me tell you the problem first, and then I'll tell you the solution is. The uh, problem is when you're acquiring locks and somebody else is holding it, okay, uh, and you both mutually hold each other's locks, okay? The solution to it, it's actually one solution to it, is what's called uh, two-phase locking, okay? And this is what I'm showing over here is two-phase locking. And in two-phase locking, what we do is that uh, we are going to acquire all the locks before we use them, and then we're going to release all the locks and we acquire the locks in a particular sequence. Okay, we always get lock one before lock two. Okay, if we had the following situation where let's say thread A. Okay, let me actually wind back a moment because now I know what I was doing wrong. So let's say this is thread A, and this is thread B. They use let's say thread A and thread B or process A and B. were written by different programmers and they use this code instead. And then release. Okay, so here, here are two A and B, and they, you know, they go different, okay, maybe they have processes A and B, but if you do this, what's going to happen is that this gets one and the other one gets two and they both get blocked over here. Okay, does that, does that make sense? So it won't happen with threads because threads are executing the same exact code. So we, I can't call this thread A, but let's just call this uh, process A. Certainly this can happen with processes because processes are not executing the same code. So, so this is what's called a deadlock. Okay. It would appear that a deadlock is easy to find. Right, because you just have two processes in there. Well, it can be worse. Okay, to begin with, this process of acquiring the lock. Okay, so we can say here's a resource. You need to have locks one, two, and three before you can use it, and you don't specify the order. And somebody at the other end of the world who's writing because it's a distributed system, they happen to implement it in this order. You implement it in the other order. You're going to have deadlock. Okay, you can also have very bad situations where you have a chain of locks. So a holds, you know, this guy needs, so you have three processes, A, B, and C. This needs one lock that, you know, that needs one that B is holding. B is waiting for C, C is waiting for A. Okay, so they're all mutually waiting for the other person to give up their lock and they're all blocked. They're all, they're all blocked and they can't make any progress. So we can come up with more complicated scenarios where you have these kinds of chains where, so for example, here A is waiting for B. This is, this I can draw as A. 
pointing to B, B pointing to A. So A needs something that B has, B needs something that A has, and that's a deadlock. Okay, that's relatively easy to detect. Here, A, uh, A needs something that B has, B needs something that C has, C needs something that A has. So now we are, we are kind of stuck right, in the deadlock situation. Uh, the way to get around this, first is to have this two-phase locking. First, you lock up everything, and you have a lock order. Okay, so, so I was gonna, I'm going to put the word deadlock, and then you have this issue of lock prioritize, uh, lock ordering. And in lock ordering, what we do is that we say, you must get one before you get two. Okay, so we can, we can just have locks in some numerical order and say you must get the lowest number at lock first and then the next one. And if you do this, this is not allowed. You'd never have this problem, okay? And then this particular uh, problem is sort of go away because you, you try to acquire the low, everybody's gonna try and acquire the lowest numbered lock. Right? When, and when you get the lowest numbered lock, they're gonna block. Or even if they get some other lower numbered lock, if you've gone past that, you know that you're never going to need anything with a lower number. Right? So even if you have two different processes which have, let's say I have lock, I need locks one and five, the second one needs two and five, okay? So this process gets one, and then it gets five, okay? And two gets blocked on five, but this process here will never need two, we know that, because five is greater than two. So this way we can be sure that this one can go ahead, you're never going to be having deadlock over here. So we're adding a priority to the locks, or a number to the locks, we can do it. But what this means is the system has to be very carefully designed. Every lock has, has a number with it, a priority with it, and you must acquire it, which means that you've got to write your code carefully. You can't just go and patch up the code and say, oops, I needed that lock. No, that lock acquisition has to be coming earlier in the day. And you just made the granularity much larger, okay? Because now you're going to lock, 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 lock. More and more things are getting locked up. And then more things have to be released in the end in the right order. And if you die, you're going to die with a lot more things locked up. Okay, so there's, there are problems to deal with over there. So lock ordering is sort of the, one of the best ways of dealing with locking, okay? And uh, that's something that uh, most systems would implement. Uh, and so in the case of a lock, Manager, if the process comes in and says, I want this lock, it'll say, oh, wait a minute, that's a lower numbered lock than what you had before, we're not gonna give it to you. Yeah? Just, just for what you're saying, can you give us a like, more concrete example? Of? Of like the lock order. Sure, sure, this one right here, we have clock, your QL1 and QL2, right? These are the two Q lens. Yeah, I can say this is lock order one, this is two. So I'm saying you must get this before you get that. So you must have no, no, you must acquire them in that order. You must acquire the locks in the order that I specify. So first get lock on one, then get lock on two. Okay. Right, so in this case I say, you must get locks in such that the number, the, uh, the, the uh, lock number is increasing. So you have lock number one and lock number five. So I must get them in increasing order, so I get lock one and five, this process gets two and five. I can see that this process is never going to be blocked by the other process because it is, you know, it, it, it can't, it won't need anything smaller. If they have anything in common, you know, one of them is going to get there first and then basically it's going to win. So in this case, because I have these two queues, it has to be the case that if I get this and I get this, I can't have this, I can't have a situation where they both hold one lock each because if you get two, you can never ask for one, right? Because of the ordering. Okay. Somebody else had a question? No? Yeah? Um, can deadlocks always be explained in like a cyclic? Yes. Yes. So, so uh, every deadlock corresponds to cycle in the appropriate graph, though I haven't actually explained that. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. Okay. Any other questions about this? Okay, so um, I want to just talk about one last thing, which is how do we uh, how do we actually implement this? And so the 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 sort of two ways of implementing this, and different languages have different kinds of support for locking. 
Uh, okay. So how do okay. So the easiest language for locking is probably Java, right? Where you define a particular object to be a synchronized object. And when you, do a, when you declare an object or a method to be a synchronized uh, uh, method or an object, then what happens is that all accesses to it are going to be uh, locked. Okay, so if, if any process or any thread tries to access it and somebody else is accessing it, the language will make sure that you can't have concurrent accesses. And that's as simple as it gets. You just say, here's the method. This is my read queue method. This is my write queue method. I'm going to put both these methods into some queue object. And I'm going to just say this is a synchronized object. And then at that point, you're basically done. So life is really simple. Okay, and that's one way of doing things. So that's the first one. That's in, that's in Java. And Java, like C Sharp, I believe, has a similar kind of thing. The second one is to use a, a lock manager. And this lock manager is sort of built into, the, into a threading package, like pthreads has a threading, uh, which is a, pthreads is a kind of a threading package for C, it's a three, C library. So uh, is anybody using pthreads here for their, for their assignment three? No, okay, is anybody using Java? <laughs> okay, a couple of people. So Java, the, the number of players in the game is something that's going to be uh, read and written. Okay, so you want to make that synchronized to make sure that you don't have this. That's another issue. Okay, and the third thing is to actually avoid avoid concurrent accesses by using message passing. And I'll explain that. Uh, okay, so how do we do message passing? Uh, what we do is that we kind of have this is the let's say I'm just going to draw the queue sideways. This is the queue over here, and I'm going to put the queue, and then I have the queue reader or Q axis. And the Q axis is being done by some process over here. What happens is that I can have any process that wants to access the Q, sorry, Q axis manager, send a message, okay, to this saying, uh, what's the Q length, okay? And the manager sends a reply back saying the Q length is whatever, okay? And it sends another message saying, OK, uh, you know, or actually, I should be more precise. The request will look something like this. It'll say DQ, OK, the Q, OK? DQ means remove from the Q. That's a request looking over here. So this manager is going to remove something and send back whatever is in the Q back to the requester. Okay, and also decrement the count over here. Okay? What's going on is that by sending this message, the act of reading from the queue and decrementing it is atomic because it's all being done through messages. Okay? It's not the, the queue access manager is enforcing atomicity because when it gets a message, it acts on the message, does it, and sends a reply back. Okay? So everything is being done through the queue access manager, and so it's not possible for two concurrent elements to access the queue at the same time. Because this queue, uh, uh, this thread uh, is going to go to the queue access manager, send a message to it saying, okay, tell me, uh, or give me something from the queue, the queue access manager does its thing, comes back and says, here's something for you, and then this thread uses it, and does its job, and then puts, and sends another message to the queue access manager saying, put this into this queue, for example, okay? And so by using these messages, we don't have the situation where two requests can enter the queue access manager at the same time. Okay? We're actually enforcing that they're always going to be entering it uh, one after the other. Okay? And by doing this, we actually don't need locking anymore, or we don't need explicit locking anymore. And this is actually a solution that's very widely used. You don't need to worry about locking. You just have what you call access managers, and then the access managers are going to guarantee that the accesses to the uh, section over here have mutual exclusion. How does mutual exclusion happen? When one process is using this, nobody else can get in. That's mutual exclusion, right? Because there's only one access manager. 
And this is a very easy thing to do. So when you have your tic-tac-toe program, for example, you want to know how many players are present, right? You have exactly this Q-axis issue, or you can just send a message to some process saying, uh, I've just incremented the number of players, or I just decremented the number of players. And you don't need to worry about that, because that message over here is going to guarantee that it's going to be happening once. Okay, and, no, and, and nothing else is going to intervene uh, along the way. Okay, so does it make sense? Okay, so I'm going to show you how we would use the Q access manager with this multiple consumer producer problem. So in this case, we assume that we have a, uh, an access manager, sort of this process over here is access manager for this queue, and you have another access manager for this queue over here. So the producer would send a message to the access manager saying, please put a job into Q1, okay? And the, uh, the second, the, and then that, uh, that comes back saying, okay, I got that. And then this thread over here, instead of touching the queue directly, would send a message saying, uh, give me a job from this queue, okay? And, and then it would wait on a read on that socket, waiting for something to happen. While there's nothing in the queue, the read is blocked on a read. When the job comes in, it gets a message back saying, here's your job, go do it. If B has got a message in blocked on a read, it's still going to be blocked on a read because this queue access manager is guaranteeing that only one is going to be released with the message saying, here, go ahead. Okay? And same thing over here. Okay? And we don't have the issue of dead block and anything like that because you know, basically these guys are blocked right here. And we're getting the uh, ordering done essentially because we have the uh, accesses being done through these queue access managers. So I'm, again, I'm kind of waving my hands a little bit, but I'm giving you sort of a sense of how we can remove the locking by essentially moving the accesses into a separate control and then sending messages in. And this is a pretty general solution. We don't need to worry about locks that much when we have these kinds of solutions over here. Okay. Any questions about this over here? Yeah. That's right. So, so the NQ and DQ would be done through messages, and so the Q accesses would then be synchronized by means of this, this manager over here. This is roughly what we do with the synchronized access in Java as well. So synchronized access basically means that this over here is being done through the language, and we make sure that all the accesses over here are going to be managed so that the synchronized access is not possible for us to have one person stomping another, which you could have when you had three. So the performance of the system is, depends on how quick it is to do these messages. If this is being done by means of packets on the, on the internet, it can be very slow. If it's being done by inside the language, using the language mechanism itself, like Java would do it, it's very fast. In any case, we have a lock manager. So the synchronized access in Java is basically as fast as any lock manager. It's, not as fast as uh, just letting it happen, you know, and then having a bug once every three months, yeah. right? That's the fastest. But uh, this one is, it can be made very fast. And this is, th that's one reason why we have these uh, synchronized accesses in inside the language. But if you use message passing, we don't need to do that. Yeah. Okay, let's look at some design principles. And And so I'm going to uh, basically cover a few uh, techniques, ideas, whatever, to uh, give distributed systems the properties that we want. Okay, so let's look at, uh, and I'll just start one straight away. So let's look at this. There's no global state. So uh, to explain this, you need to understand what is meant by state. And what's meant by global state, okay? So a state of a, of a system or a state of a process is basically something that completely describes what it is doing, what it, what it has, right? So uh, to make a very specific example, if you take the tic-tac-toe program, the state of the server uh, is the board state. You know, if you know what the board is, you pretty much know everything about what's happening at the server. The state of the client is also as it happens, the board state, and whether it's its turn or not. OK, 
Okay, once you know these two things, you know everything about the client. And you can generalize that to say, okay, you know, we have uh, equivalent state for different things. For example, if you use uh, uh, you know, Facebook as an example, the state of the Facebook program server is everybody, every user's uh, account, you know, what they have on their account, plus who's related to whom, who's friends with whom, and things like that. So all of that is many, many terabytes of information, but that's also all kind of the state. When we have a distributed system, we have these different entities that are scattered all over the world, then they each have their local state, they each have some variables describing them, and in the, the design principle of global state basically means that we should not need each entity or entity over here to take an action depending on the state of everybody else. Okay, there's no need for them to know about the global state because there isn't a global state, okay? Because they don't know about other things. If you had any global state, you would need to have some centralized entity and they all report to them the local state and then they all wait to know what, to be, what needs to be done and then it's not very efficient. So as much as possible, we want to prevent, we want to avoid having this kind of global state, okay? We want to have this local, local state, okay? Um, I don't know if that's, okay, so maybe I'll pause and say, are there any questions about this? I mean, does it make sense? Okay, we don't want uh, entity over here to have to ask everybody else, all the other pro processes, uh, what their status before it takes any action. Otherwise, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to be, uh, not make any sense to do that. So to give us, maybe I'll give a specific example of this. Um, when you have a BitTorrent client, for example, the BitTorrent client is doing this uh, tit-for-tat exchange with the other BitTorrent clients. You remember from what I, Andy talked to you, right? Uh, the BitTorrent client, it doesn't depend on the tracker to tell it what its uh, relationship is with the other clients. It doesn't have to say, oh no, you shouldn't uh, send it to the other guy because he hasn't sent you any, right? They each keep track locally of what it is that other clients have done for them or given them or not given them, right? So they're keeping track of that debt relationship locally, right? So if these are BitTorrent clients and that's the tracker over here, a global state would be the tracker keeping track of everybody's relationship and then saying, okay, no, don't send it to him, no, send it to that other uh, entity over here. Uh, and by doing that, it would be in interfering with everybody and would slow things down and would be a single point of failure, so basically centralized. Right? But by removing this tracker, one, the, all the tracker is telling you is who else is there. By having these entities directly talk to each other, all the decision making is basically local. It's just keeping track and it makes a decision locally. Yes, I'm going to send uh, some uh, files over here and no, I'm not going to send anything over there because that's a local decision and there's no global state. And that's one reason why BitTorrent is very popular okay, because it uh, doesn't have any global state. Any questions about this? Okay, the second thing we want to have is we want to have no central control. And this is sort of uh, related. So the no global state basically means it's a distributed system. If, it were global, if, it not, if you had global state, it wouldn't be a distributed system really. It would be sort of centralized. No central control again. You know, we have a distributed system, there's no central controller, there's no, no single person in the center saying you must do this, you should do that, whatever. And uh, so this is very important. An example of central control would be like a global lock manager that manages everything, right? If you have a global lock manager for managing all accesses to all entities, that would be uh, an example of central control. And if you just had one central lock manager for let's say all of Facebook, you can imagine you have 800 million customers clients, whatever, using it, and every request goes to a centralized lock manager, nothing would really work. It wouldn't scale up at all. So no central control is necessary for us to have scalability and to avoid single points of failure. And then we want to basically assume no global clock. This one is sort of a, it's, a, it's, not, it's not clear whether we should use this principle anymore at all. In the old days, it was very hard to get accurate clocks, okay? Uh, so if you had one entity, one computer running, let's say in Waterloo, other computer running at the other end of the world, 
okay? And they were both trying to agree on what happened before what, what other time. The fact is that it was very hard to keep these clocks synchronized. It was basically impossible to say what the time was, okay? And so they may come to different conclusions about the ordering of events. And so in the distributed systems literature and distributed systems implementations you know, that go back 15, 20 years, uh, the assumption has been made that we can't assume that they know what the time is. What the, what, you know, we shouldn't assume global time, right? This has changed in two ways in recently. The first thing is that uh, with GPS, we get very cheap clocks, and the clocks are, are globally synchronized. Okay, so I don't know if you know this, but every GPS receiver, even your $5 receiver, it has got in it a clock that's accurate to a few nanoseconds. Okay, and the reason why it's so accurate is because that's how it figures out where you are. Okay, the, the global time, uh, uh, and uh, what it does is that basically the, the different satellites are sending a message saying, uh, my time now is this, okay? And you have this global time that these receivers have, and then they compare the time that the signal was sent from the satellite, the time it got to them, and by looking at the time difference, they know how far away the satellite is, right? Just from the time difference. And so if you know three different satellite positions and the time difference, uh, the distance of three satellites, at that point you know exactly where you are, okay? Because the satellites say, I am here, and so you have basically your distance to three different locations, okay? You know exactly how far they are. So the distance to these precise locations uh, is de determined from the time, okay? So, okay, you guys in geography, you should know this, right? You know this stuff pretty well? So, beg your pardon? Triangulation. Triangulation. So the, the satellite has a very, very precise notion of where it is in space. Okay, it has a very specific coordinate in space. It knows exactly where it is. And it knows exactly what the time is because they have atomic clocks on the satellites. Each receiver, all it knows is the, is the correct time, precise time. And by, by, by measuring the difference in time, and they know the speed of propagation approximately, they know the distance, and once you have the three distances, your triangulation, then you know where you are. And this is pretty accurate. It's down to a few meters these days. So the bottom line is that these things have very, very accurate time. So if you put the GPS receiver next to your, your, your computer or your laptop or your cell phone as a built-in GPS receiver, you actually know the time down to a few nanoseconds. Okay? If you know the time, which you can think of as universal time, okay, unless you're moving at relativistic speeds, it doesn't matter, okay, you have universal time, we can actually get a global clock because what you do is you have some event like a packet arrival or something happens, you timestamp it according to universal time and you know exactly what happened before and what happened after okay? because it's all on the same time base. Right? And so this no global clock is the basis for many thousands of papers in this area and I'm beginning to think that they're all wrong okay? because of this first thing. The second reason why is that recent advances in in uh, time synchronization. So how does time synchronization work? Uh, you don't have GPS anymore, you have two nodes, and you have a time server. And the time server is basically sending a time signal, like so, to both of them, and they coordinate and they get the time. So for how many of you have a, a, a Mac laptop, or something like that, okay, some of you. So you have a Mac laptop, you have the set date and time, it'll ask you, should you set time automatically, and it'll ask you for NTP server. Network Time Protocol Server, right? You've guys seen that? And say, so choose NTP server from America, or so choose NTP server from whatever. And I think, does Windows have this? Automatic time setting probably has that too. So this, what happening, what's happening is that over the internet, you can communicate with the time server, and the time server is basically adjusting your clock for you, okay? It used to be that the times were synchronized to about 10 milliseconds, okay? About 10 milliseconds, it used to be, uh, was how, it was done. However, recently, uh, some researchers in Australia have figured out a way to get this down to about 1.5 microseconds, okay? 1.5 microsecond accuracy time synchronization over the internet, right? Like about 1,000 times faster, a 1,000 times more accurate, and that's really amazing, right? So now you can take your laptop, you can plug it in, and you know that your time is accurate to within 1.5 microseconds of the true time, okay? And given this, you know, there's no global clock assumption. I don't think is needed anymore. But anyway, just for, 
So that's why I put a question mark on it, but just for you know, uh, clarity, I put it in here. You do want to be careful if you make a global clock assumption that you have either GPS or the new algorithms because the 10 milliseconds is actually not good enough, but 1.5 microseconds, that is actually good enough for most things that you do. So maybe this design principle is not needed anymore. Okay. All right. If, okay, so let me talk about few more principles and then I'll stop for the day. So the other thing is what we call separate policy and, and mechanism. This is a very general principle, just like these other ones. And so the question is, what is policy and what is mechanism? A mechanism is essentially a way to achieve something, right? And the policy is the, is the tuning knobs, okay? So what we're saying over here is that when you build the mechanism, build it in a way where you don't choose what the tuning knobs are, okay? I'll give a very specific example of this building on what we talked about with the lock managers, right? So we have this notion of locking, let us say the lock manager, and we have granularity of the locks. We have a spatial and a temporal granularity of the locks. The lock manager is implementing a mechanism, which is locking, okay? But how granular it should be is something the lock manager cannot decide. The lock manager cannot decide whether it should be at this level or that level. All the lock manager can really do or should be doing is to say, look, I'm a lock manager, use it for whatever you want to lock, okay? And then the policy means when you use the lock manager, you can decide what granularity to choose because it depends on the application. And so in a distributed system or in any system, really, we want to separate the policy and mechanism. We want the lock manager to not make a decision that yes, the locks must be fine-grained or it must be coarse-grained. It can be whatever grain you want, and the mechanism says, okay, you can lock it. And then it's up to you to decide what granularity you want because it depends, okay? And that's an example of separating policy from uh, mechanism. And so generally speaking, when you build a system, in particular when you build a distributed system, you want to be careful to say, look, this is just a mechanism and here are the tuning knobs. You can choose the knobs as you wish. It doesn't matter what you choose. I'll work with all of them, but uh, I don't want to decide what those knobs are, okay? It's up to you to decide. And it's similar to, you know, the idea of in a, in a, in a uh, again, in, in a user interface design, right? We have, uh, in many modern programs, we have this toolbar on top, right? People have seen toolbars. Different people want different things on toolbars. If you use Adobe, for example, or, or most Microsoft Office products, you have this toolbar on top, and they have like 10 different things, but you can have a 1,000 different things, right? The mechanism of the toolbar is to say, you can put 10 different things, okay? But the policy of what is put on the toolbar is up to you, right? So they separated the policy and the mechanism. The mechanism says, show any 10 things. Now, in the old days, there were exactly 10 things that they chose. Microsoft, in its infinite wisdom, chose, these are the 10 things you're going to see, and all the rest is hidden away somewhere. But in the modern stuff, it says, no, we're not, we're not combining the policy into mechanism. The policy of displaying the stuff on the toolbar and the mechanism is not combined, it's separated out. And so this can be th thought of as being essentially customizability. Okay, you can, you can customize the system by choosing the control knobs, and that's another example of separating policy and mechanism. So in general, we should try and do that. Uh, okay, the next principle I, I'd like to talk about is what's called explicit interfaces. So this explicit interfaces is basically saying that when you have an implementation, you have some goo around it, and on top of it, you put the interface. And I think I talked about this earlier already. And this interface is basically saying, these, this is the only way you can access it. These are the set of, set of methods or techniques to access the, the computation that's happening over here, okay? And by explicitly defining these interfaces, you avoid many, many problems, okay? You avoid what's called spaghetti code, where you have you know, random accesses into this. So for example, if there is a, an array over here, okay, then every access into the array should be through the interface. You can't have some random person, random process pointing to the array and accessing it, okay? And this is the basis of what's called object-oriented design. 
And in the distributed system, we want to be very clear about exactly the kinds of things that can be accessed or cannot be accessed. And this is also the basis for how we build libraries. So if you use any kind of library, we say, OK, here's a set of methods. Here's a set of things you can do. And these are the only things you can do with it. And if you use those methods, everything is going to be fine, OK, because they, they've been tested. But anything else, it's, 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 you're, you're going to be in trouble. So it's always good to have explicit interfaces to anything that you design. So uh, again, to link it to something that you did, when you did the tic-tac-toe program, I asked you to define the messages and the message actions. What happens in each message action? That was to basically enforce these interfaces. Okay? When you get a message, what action you take is, in fact, the interface that is defined by the server to the clients about what actions it does. So each message and the message action corresponds to an interface that's opened up by the server. So by making those messages explicit and looking at the actions separately, you have basically done a very clean design because that message could have been generated by anybody, any client that you wanted. Okay, and that's the interface design over here.